This is England, England before June 6, 1944. From these shores, the United Nations were soon to launch the greatest military expedition of its kind in history, the cross-channel invasion of Europe against the Nazi power. Vast preparations were being made, huge quantities of materiel and supplies collected, guns, half-tracks, bombs, ambulances. Yes, ambulances. For in the midst of all this preparation and this training for destruction, there went on an opposite kind of preparation. Preparation for the business of saving life, of preserving limb and tissue, of easing pain. Through the endless English months of war games and maneuvers, the medical corpsmen of the ground forces worked with their units. They grew tough and inured to battle conditions. They learned the prime importance of speed. As the day drew nearer and the grand strategy was mapped, the medical corps drafted its plans to fit. The disposition of hospital facilities in England would be as follows. In the north, scattered over a wide area, the general hospitals, large institutions completely equipped for every type of medical service. A few miles inland from the south coast and spotted near railroads would be a series of transit hospitals through which would pass all the casualties arriving in England. Here they would be classified and routed to the various general hospitals in the north. And along the coast, close to the beaches and ports in each receiving area, there were to be holding hospitals, fully equipped for emergency surgery. Here, serious cases could receive attention immediately on their arrival in England. These were the plans. And this was the reality. The general hospital, the transit hospital, the holding hospital. Better equipped than many a permanent institution back home. The tents stood empty, ready, waiting for the day. June 6th, D-Day. The great plan is put to the test. lies in wait, is determined to stop us as we are to land. First American soldiers hit the beach. The medics have moved in with them and their work begins. Aid stations are established on the spot and an astounding record starts piling up. The checkup later reveals that 80 to 90 percent of the wounded received medical care within 10 minutes of being hit. Immediately, the business of evacuation begins. Worst wounds get first priority. Right back they go to the boats that landed them but a short time before. This is part of the plan. Where the LSTs are unable to come in close enough, the smaller craft are used to get the wounded to them. so the ships receive their damaged human cargoes for the trip back. All along the beaches they wait. As the fighting develops, every means is used to hasten the removal of the wounded from the scene of battle. The jeep of all trades is pressed into service and proves itself again. sets out with its load of wounded. Through it all, the slogan of speed remains the keynote. The LSTs used in the Normandy invasion were designed to become emergency hospital ships as soon as their fighting cargoes had been deposited ashore. In the hold, wall brackets were installed for the support of tiers of litters. Each LST could accommodate 200 or more patients. And in the first days of the invasion, 90% of the wounded were evacuated on these ships. The 
smoke, a drink of water, trophies, and rest. The dead rest of exhaustion. Elsewhere on the ship, a life is being saved. Some wounds can't wait. So planning included an operating room on each LST and an experienced army surgeon to augment the regular naval medical staff. And soon it will be England again, and rest, and care, and safety. The routing of the ships had been carefully planned to avoid congestion at any one landing point on the English coast. As each ship disembarked its wounded, those cases needing immediate surgery or other treatment were moved to the nearest holding hospital. Then, as soon as they were transportable again, they were moved inland to the transit hospital serving the area. All other cases, and these were in the great majority, were moved directly from the landing point of the transit hospital, and from there were routed by special train to the north. Every preparation for these moves had been made. Ambulance companies strung out all along the coast were under the control of evacuation officers at each receiving area. 5,000 of these vehicles stood by, ready for immediate service. The ships start coming in some to ports, some to piers in outlying areas. Others pull up directly onto the beaches. No time is lost in moving out the wounded. Specially trained sanitary companies take over the litter jobs and the business of unloading begins. Evacuation officers supervise. The disposition of each litter case has been decided. And so man helps man. An American teamwork proves itself once more. And the job is shortly done. The emergency cases move out first. Often it's only a matter of minutes before a dangerous wound has been x-rayed. A decision made. And a patient readied for surgery. As soon after the operation, is it safe for him to travel? He's moved out and sent off to the transit hospital. In Normandy, the fighting has moved inland. In the last war, when a soldier was wounded, he just had to watch and wait until an aid man found him. Now the order is reversed. The aid man does the watching and waiting. It is at the side of the casualty as soon as he becomes one. In addition, the American corpsman today unlike his counterpart in previous wars, is qualified to administer morphine and plasma and to render numerous other services to the wounded. All this is making a vast difference in the saving of life. Some of the wounded filter back to the aid station on foot, but evacuation by walking and hand litter bearing soon gives way to the faster method of evacuation by jeep. The battalion aid station operates just behind the lines. Here the trained corpsman again demonstrates his value, taking over many jobs that the physician would otherwise have to perform. This frees the doctor's time for more detailed attention to the serious cases. Next, the wounded are brought to a collecting station a mile or so farther back. There are facilities here for further emergency treatment if needed. But the primary job is the transporting of the wounded with all possible speed to the clearing station. This is located far enough to the rear to avoid exposure to direct enemy action. 
Here, medical officers, expert in judging the condition of casualties, sort the patients and determine their disposition. Urgent cases needing certain specialized types of surgery are turned over to the field hospital, which is set up close by. The great majority of operations here are for perforating abdominal wounds and sucking wounds of the chest, like this one. Whole blood flown in from England consolidates the gains that have been made by life-saving plasma at the front. On D-Day plus four, the first evacuation hospital goes up in France. This is the largest and most elaborate type of tent installation used in the combat zone. Nevertheless, it's ready to receive patients within 30 minutes, and operating starts in two hours. Three of them going on at once. Count them. Skilled army nurses look after the patients, and there are such comforts as cots and mattresses hot food. Many of the less seriously wounded will make complete recoveries here and report to replacement depots in a matter of days. But cases requiring prolonged periods of convalescence are sent back to England. Plane evacuation, expected to begin about D-Day plus seven, has actually begun on D-Day plus three. Within a fortnight, we're flying out more than a thousand wounded a day, and sea evacuation has been almost entirely supplanted. The air trip from France to England takes about an hour. Speed has won another triumph and it becomes a common occurrence for a soldier wounded in France in the morning to be resting in a general hospital in England by evening. From the landing field, the patients are shuttled to the transit hospital. And before long, they're boarding the hospital trains that pull out daily from nearby railway spurs for the trip north. And the last leg of the journey begins. General hospitals are telling some remarkable stories these days, like 16,000 casualties handled by one group and only 15 deaths. What is making such records possible, of course, is the fine condition in which patients are arriving due to the splendid work of units all along the line. In the first two months of the invasion, some 76,000 wounded were handled by the medical department. In World War I, 8% of these men would not have survived. Today, less than 3% are being lost. And many who would have been invalided for life will be totally healed. So the careful planning of months bears fruit. And men who knew the battlefield but a few short hours back knew the pain, the suffering, now know the care, the comfort, and the hope that the best in modern medicine can bring. <laughs>